All right, let's get a songbook. Stand together. Page 113. Glory to his name. There's going to be a test at the end of the service. <laughs> do a good job up there? Hey Amen. Great job. Appreciate that. Good to see all of you here tonight. This is our prayer meeting and uh, boy what is it up with these cell phones going off behind me and in front of me. You guys are going to scare me to death. I'll tell you what. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. That's right. That was the special music tonight, by the way. You just heard it. <laughs> this is our prayer meeting time, so if you have a prayer request, a praise report, we'll give that in at this time, and then we'll gather around the altar for prayer. So if you have any, yes. All right. All right. All right. Let's continue to remember her in our prayers. Any others? Just remember Lisa. Lisa came through surgery. Uh, it was about a five and a half hour surgery. Uh, actually, my wife is still there. She just called and said, everything's good. Everything looks great. So we thank God for that. Remember her, though. She's got a long recovery, uh, but she had a very extensive surgery today. Remember her. Uh, continue to remember her in your prayers. Any others? Yes. Let's remember her mom in our prayers. Yes. Let's remember those needs tonight. Any other requests? Yes, Lamar? God bless you, Lord. Amen. Yes, Fred? Yes, remember uh, Sister Roop in our prayers. Any others? Yes. All right. All right, let's remember her. Any others? Yes. All right, let's remember all those that are traveling back. Remember the Vaquero family. Continue to remember them. In your prayers. Any other? Remember those those requests. Any others? Yes. 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 Remember Rick Cash. To remember him in our prayers. Yes. All right. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's remember that. Any others? 
Any unspoken requests? All that will gather around the altar as we, we sing. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from the and bids me at my Father's throne, makes all my words come for tonight's offering. Brother Henry, 
Why don't you pray for us? If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter Continuing looking at our, our daily lives uh, in heaven, uh, questions that we might have. Uh, someone, someone asked me today, where are you getting these questions from? I said, well, a lot of them have been asked, and uh, some of them, you know, uh, we're trying to, still trying to find the answers to. Uh, that's what we're continuing to do. Uh, we'll look at a couple questions tonight. And, be dismissed. Psalm chapter 78, and we, the question, the first question we're going we're to talk about tonight uh, is will we literally eat and drink in heaven? Um, and why do you believe either way? A lot of times when you, when you say these questions, you'll see half of them going and the other half going, you know, so... We're trying to back what we say with Scripture. Now, there are some things that are right out of Scripture. It tells us what's going to happen. There are some things Scripture says, and it can go one or two ways, and then stuff the Scripture doesn't say nothing on. And we, we just, you know, we, we, there are different views and different thoughts, and so we try to share uh, all of that. But, but not all Christians believe that we will eat and drink in heaven. Uh, I guess we should preface that by saying, do we have to eat to live in heaven? Will we cease to exist if we don't eat uh, in heaven? Uh, you know, we can't go however many days without food, however many days without water. Obviously, that's not the case in heaven. Is there a need for food? Is there a need uh, for uh, something to drink in heaven? What does the Bible say? Uh, some people uh, cite, and I'm not going to have you turn there, but you can jot this down. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, some people cite this verse uh, of saying that we will not eat or drink in heaven. This is what it says. I'm paraphrasing. You can look it up at home. Uh, the Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, 
but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So they use that verse as to say, see it's saying right there, the kingdom of God uh, is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not going to be there. But again, this is one of those verses that you can take it out of context. You've got to read the whole chapter. And what this passage is talking about is not about the afterlife. Paul is speaking about our walk with God and the importance of not making other people stumble over what we eat and what we drink. Uh, if you remember back uh, in, in the, that time, uh, some of the uh, Jews started eating with the Gentiles uh, and, and started eating what they would eat. We know Peter was, was doing it. He was con, uh, consuming food that was uh, considered unclean by the Jews. Um, and, and in James, James talks about it, how you know, we are not to be a stumbling block. If you, if you come across a person who uh, you know they think it's wrong to do to eat a certain thing, don't sit in front of them and eat it. Uh, that's becoming a stumbling block. And so we want to be sensitive to that. That is what Paul is talking about here. So again, we have another verse that people take completely out of context. Um, but in Psalm 78, I think it's very interesting. Look where you should be there. Psalm 78, notice the, the, the words that are used here. Uh, talking about when uh, the, the people of Israel were fed uh, by God. Uh, in verse 25, look what it says. Man did eat what? Angels food. He sent them meat, meat to the, the full. So I think it's pretty interesting right there that, uh, that manna is referred to as angels' food, or, or the bread of angels. Uh, we do know when, when angels and God himself, when they took on human form, they ate human food. Uh, does that mean they're eating that over in heaven? Well, we know this. We know in the heaven, the future heaven, the present heaven now, there's a thing called the tree of life, right? Oh, why does the Bible go to the extent to tell us that there will be a different fruit each month that will come up that is there on the trees. I believe it's telling us that, obviously, because we can eat it. Uh, what about when Jesus died, when he came back to life, when he was resurrected? Jesus invited his disciples. He said, come and have breakfast. In fact, the Bible says he prepared them a meal and then ate bread and fish with them. Uh, so he proved that a resurrected body is capable of eating food, real food. Now Christ could have abstained from eating. He could have said, listen, I'm making this fish for you, but I can't eat it because I'm a resurrected being. But, but he didn't. And the fact that he didn't is a powerful statement about the nature of his resurrection body and ours in the future. Other passages indicate that we'll eat at feasts. Don't you love that word, feasts? And they, they announce that. It's talking about eating feasts uh, with Jesus Christ in an earthly kingdom. We talked about it last week. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. When at the Last Supper, he said, I, I can't drink this with you, but in the future, in heaven, I will drink this with you. Uh, on another occasion... Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 8, He said, Many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Won't that be something? To eat and across from you is Abraham? I mean, do you not have some questions? Isaac and, and Jacob and, and eating with all these different saints of God uh, but it says that in, in Matthew chapter 8, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, an angel in heaven said to John, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. What do people do at suppers? I mean, couldn't he have just said the, the wedding gathering? But he said the wedding supper. Everybody eats at supper, especially a wedding supper. Uh, eating and drinking, we, we talk, we tell stories, we celebrate, we laugh. We even have dessert at suppers. 
especially wedding suppers. Do you know that wedding feasts often lasted a full week in the Middle East? So how long is this wedding supper going to last? Aren't you glad you didn't have to cater that, you guys that have daughters that got married? A full week. I got two. I don't know what's going to happen. Really pushing them towards eloping now. I think that's kind of... But wedding feasts lasted full weeks. And I believe when we attend the wedding supper of the Lamb, we're not going to be guests. We're the bride, okay? So we're going to be right there in it. And it's going to be a, a wonderful time uh, together. Uh, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, another place in our Bibles that, that we see a mention of, of what's taking place in heaven. In Luke chapter 24... This is the very first time Jesus appears to his disciples after he was crucified. So he, he's been dead for three days. Now they're hiding in a room. They're scared. The last thing they saw or they knew about is, is, is the, the beaten body, the face they couldn't recognize. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in their presence. Remember, um, one of the disciples, Thomas, he, he wasn't there. But the rest of them were, and I want you to notice what he does. Notice exactly uh, his words. In verse number 40, it said, And when he had thus spoken, if you look in verse 39, he's showing you, this is my hands, my feet, it's me, myself, handle me. I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I have flesh, I have bones. And he says in, in verse 40, When he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered... Of all the things Jesus could say next, what does he say? Hey, you got anything to eat? <laughs> I love that right there. He could have said anything. They're wondering. They're joyful that they see him, but they're still wondering. Is this really Jesus? Is this really a ghost? I'm not sure. Hey, guys, you got anything to eat? Ghosts don't eat. He asked for, for some food. And while they yet believed not for joy, he, he said, Have you any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. Uh, they gave him a fish fillet sandwich, a piece of honeycomb. That's dessert right there. And he took it and did eat before them. So anybody who says that once you're dead, once you die, and, and you come back with this resurrected body, you're not going to need to eat, and you're not going to eat. We see Jesus is eating. Did Jesus have to eat? To live after he was resurrected. No. But the first thing he says to them. You guys want some food. So these passages to me. Emphatically. Link eating. And drinking to the resurrected state. And the fact that it is so often repeated. Means that it's not viewed as incidental. When we're told we're going to have resurrected bodies like Christ and that he ate in his resurrected body, and when the Bible refers to tables and banquets and eating and drinking in his kingdom, I think the answer is obvious. We will eat in heaven. Say amen right there. And we will drink and, and, and all these things in heaven. Now some of you might be saying, well, I wonder how the food's going to taste. Do you know only two people lived before the fall, right? Only two people. Adam and Eve. That means only two people have ever eaten food at its best. Only two people have eaten food without the curse being present, and that was Adam. In fact, they ate food before and had it before, the, and then they ate afterward. Wouldn't you love to sit down and say, hey, how did it taste different? After the fall. But I know what some of you men are thinking. Will we eat meat in heaven? Because that's important, right? Do you know that animal meat was a result of the fall? Now, I'm going to blow some of your theology up right here. You're probably going to walk out. God's provision of food for people... And even for animals. Uh, in the Garden of Eden was clearly indicated when he said these words, 
In James, he said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. You know, I've been studying this and looked at this. I wanted to see, I don't know why, but I wanted to see the first place or the first time people started eating meat. Do you know it appears that neither people nor animals ate meat until after the flood? Think of that. I just always thought Adam and Eve are kicked out, right, of the Garden of Eden. Now they have to, to, to toil and work the field and, and, and God said, listen, it's going to produce thorns and thistles. It's not going to be like it was in the Garden of Eden. And they start killing animals because they need clothing, right? And I just assumed they ate the animals. You won't find it until after the flood that they're eating animals. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't eat them, but we're never told that they ate them. And then after the flood, God said, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. So it makes since that people wouldn't eat meat before the fall when living beings didn't die. And if, as I believe, animal death was the result of the fall, animal death was the result of the curse, once the curse has been lifted on the new earth, animals will no longer die. This suggests... I'm sorry, guys, that people may become vegetarians. We're all going to be vegans in heaven. As they apparently were in Eden and during the time before the flood. And I know what you're saying, but I don't want to eat broccoli and carrots the rest of my life in heaven. That doesn't sound good to me. But think about it. How hard would it be for God to create far better substitutes that qualify as meat in every sense of taste and texture without coming from a dead animal. I mean, you think about it. We eat dead animals, and we think it's delicious. I can't wait till they kill that chicken. I'm going to eat a dead animal and that dead cow and that dead fish, and it's dead, and we eat it, and it's delicious. But it's a dead animal. So who says God can't make something far greater? So I think we're really living below where we should. We think animal is the best thing we've ever had. Remember, that's part of the curse. What's this going to be like in heaven? Now some people say this, well, Jesus ate fish in a resurrected body. But remember, that was still on the earth. He came back and was on the earth. Still under the curse, not Jesus, the earth, under the curse. Hunting and and killing animals is legitimate, sometimes necessary on the present earth. However, to the degree that hunting animals, does it not involve their fear and their suffering and their death? That doesn't fit with the biblical description of the new earth. We're not only people, but also animals live in peace and harmony. Remember what we read last week? Remember Isaiah chapter 65? The Bible says the wolf and the lamb will feed on each other? No, they'll feed together. The Bible says the lion, this is very important here, the lion will eat straw like an ox, the Bible says. And it says this, they will neither harm nor destroy. So we're told right there in Isaiah 65 that animals' eating habits will change. Lions are eating straw. So if animals' eating habits will change, why not ours? I know what we think. We think the food chain, it seems natural to us, but I believe it violates God's original design. There's not a food chain in the Garden of Eden before the fall. So I believe no more curse... No more death means no more food change in, in, chain involving living creatures. So you have a, a radical, uh, as radical a shift that may seem to us. It seems like it's going to be a return to God's original design. So on the new earth, 
we will consume, I believe, a wonderful array of fruits and, and vegetables that doesn't require death. And I believe we'll eat all kinds of other foods we don't even know about that God's going to give to us. That, that tastes better, but isn't animal flesh. Okay? Uh, so if the product of the curse and death can taste good to fallen taste buds today, how much better will God specially design the foods in the future and smell and taste to our resurrected senses. All right? I'm ready to go eat a T-bone steak right now. How about you? Someone asked this last week, and they were serious. Will we drink coffee in heaven? Oh, quit acting like you're all godly and... That's real spiritual, though, isn't it? I'm going to address this question simply for the benefit of coffee lovers. I don't like coffee. I don't drink it. But some may say, I sure hope there'll be coffee in heaven. Amen. See? Three of them. But it's a statement that few people would attempt to defend biblically, right? But consider these facts. God made coffee. Coffee grows on earth which God made for mankind, put under our management and filled with resources for our use. When God evaluated his creation, he deemed coffee trees, along with everything else, to be very good. Many people throughout history have enjoyed coffee. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, God tells us that he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Does everything include coffee? Realizing that caffeine addiction or anything else that's unhealthy simply won't exist on the new heaven. So can you think of any reason why coffee trees and coffee drinking wouldn't be part of the resurrected earth? If you believe the new earth will have fewer resources for human enjoyment than Eden did, or, or than the world under the curse offers, then you probably won't believe it'll be there, but... I understand it's fine if you don't like coffee, but to suggest it's unspiritual, well, that's a stretch. I mean, it was here in the Garden of Eden. The trees were there. As I said, I believe we'll eat from the fruit trees. I really believe we will. There's every reason to believe we'll drink fruit juice from, made from those trees, from the tree of life. So along with drinking fruit juice, is there any reason to suppose you wouldn't drink coffee or even tea? Can you imagine drinking coffee or tea with Jesus? Can you imagine that? I don't think I've ever thought of that before. If you can't, why not? The only compelling reason for not having coffee in heaven would be if coffee were sinful or harmful, but it won't be. And I can't believe I just wasted five minutes talking about coffee in heaven. <laughs> so should we be looking forward to feasts? Should we even talk about feasts? In heaven? Why not? It's mentioned a ton of places in the Bible. You and I have never eaten food in a world untouched by the fall and curse. So the palate, the taste buds, they were injured in the fall, as were all food sources. The best tasting food we've ever eaten wasn't nearly as good as it must have tasted in Eden or as it will in the new heaven or new earth. Think right now, the best meal you have ever eaten in your life or the best meal you will eat is still ahead of you on the new earth. Now, if it seems trivial or unspiritual to anticipate such things, remember that it's God who promises that on the new earth we're going to sit at tables, we're going to have banquets, we're going to have feasts, we're going to enjoy the finest foods and drinks and top it off we're going to be feasting and eating with Jesus Christ himself. Don't you think he wants us to look forward to eating at tables with him? I do. Question number two. Will we be capable of sinning in heaven? Yeah, shake your head no. Go ahead. No, no. How can you say that? And here's where this question comes from. 
Did Lucifer sin in heaven? Did he? Yes, he did. Shake your head yes. Yes, he did. Was heaven not a perfect place when Lucifer was there? Yet he sinned, did he not? He had pride. It was a perfect place. Where did the sin come from? So if Lucifer can sin in a perfect place, can't we? (laughs) When I was 10 or 11, I'm going to tell you a story I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to anyway. I feared that, yes, I'm going to make it to heaven, but I'm going to do something stupid like Lucifer and get kicked out. I'm going to sin, and I'm going to start it all over again. There's going to be another Bible with another fall. Because of all people, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to do something. And I was fearful of that. And I would, I would get mad because I thought, God, that's not fair. I mean, I'm saved. I'm going to make it. But then finally I'm there in heaven, and I'm going to, I know it. I'm just going to mess it up. And I'm going to get kicked out. People have even said to me, heaven will be perfect But a sinless environment doesn't mean we can't sin. Adam and Eve proved that, right? They lived in a sinless place, yet they sinned. And again, it's true, Satan tempted them, but but he too originally was a perfect being, living in a perfect environment, beholding God himself. Not only was there no sin in heaven, there was no sin in the universe, yet Satan sinned. So heaven's perfection, it seems, doesn't guarantee there'll be no future sin. How many know being human demands free choice? Therefore, we must have the capacity to choose evil in heaven. Now, I'm not saying, I'm just giving you what others are saying. And if that's true, if that's true, then we could experience another fall, couldn't we? Clearly, this is a question of great importance. So great, we talked about it in Sunday school two weeks ago. So we brought it up. People were thinking, you know, I thought about that too. So can we know we won't sin in heaven? Revelation chapter 21. Turn your Bibles there. I think we've come to this chapter probably about ten times in this study. But it's very important that you, that you see what's being said here. <clears throat> Revelation 21. Look down at verse number four. Again, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Christ promises on the new earth, on the new heaven, there's going to be no more death, there's going to be no more crying, no mourning, no pain. He says, for the former things, or the old order of things, has passed away. Now get this. Since the wages of sin is death, right? The promise here in verse 4 of no more death is a promise of no more sin. You understand that? Those who will never die can never sin. Since sinners always die. Sin causes mourning. Sin causes crying. Sin causes pain. And if those will never occur again, then sin can never occur again. Consider the last part of Revelation 21, 4. For the former things have passed away. What's passed away? Death. It's passed away. It's gone. Mourning, crying, 
They're all part of an old order of things that will forever be behind us. The sin that caused them will be no longer. Church, we need not fear a second fall. Thank God for that. Scripture emphasized to us in various places that Christ died once to deal with sin and will never again need to die. Remember Ricky Truett's song, Once Was Enough for Me? Hebrews 9, 26 through 28 tells us this. Hebrews 10, 10 tells us this. 1 Peter 3, 18 tells us one time is all he had to die to take care of all the sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, we will now have the very righteousness of God. We won't sin in heaven for the same reason God doesn't. He cannot sin. Our eternal inability to sin has been purchased by Christ's blood. On the cross, validated by His resurrection, our Savior purchased our perfection, get this, for all time. What it says in Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21 Look down in verse number 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Saying nothing impure will ever enter into the new Jerusalem. Nor will anyone who does what's shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written. Understand the passage doesn't say, if someone becomes impure or shameful or deceitful, that person will be evicted. Does it say that? No. That Satan and the unsaved and all the demons of hell are cast forever into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 verse 10. Revelation 21 verse 8. That shows us an eternal separation of evil from the new earth for all of eternity. Heaven will be completely void of evil with no threat of becoming tainted. Hebrews 9.26 says that Christ sacrificed himself to put away sin or to do away with sin. So understand, sin in heaven, in the future, will be a thing of the past. When our bodies are raised, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we will be raised incorruptible. Our risen bodies will be immune to corruption. So since the wages of sin is death, if we cannot die, then we cannot sin. Christ will not allow us to be vulnerable to the very thing he died to deliver us from. Okay? But do we have free will in heaven? Or are we just robots? Turn to Romans chapter 5. This is where we'll close tonight. Romans chapter 5. Some people believe that if we have free will in heaven, we'll have to be free to sin, as were the first humans. But you have to understand, Adam and Eve's situation was different. They were innocent, then became guilty through their own choice to sin, but they had not been made righteous by Christ. You cannot talk about this whole thing of free will and, and sin in heaven without going back to the cross of Christ and what he did. We, on the other hand, became righteous through Christ's shed blood, through his atonement. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. 
For as by one man's disobedience, talking about Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, talking about Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Simply put, because of Adam's sin, you're a sinner on your way to hell. But aren't you thankful for the second Adam who came along? Because of the second Adam, because of Christ's sacrifice, we are now made righteousness in Jesus Christ. To suggest in heaven that we could have Christ's righteousness now and and yet sin is to say again that then Christ could sin. And that's just not possible. In heaven there will be no evil desires. There'll be no corruption, and we will fully participate in the sinless perfection of God. But we go back to the beginning. But what about Satan? How did Satan fall? Why was he allowed to sin? Why was he kicked out from heaven? Because Jesus Christ did not die yet, and Jesus Christ did not die for the angels. How important does that make you feel tonight? He died for you. And he died for every sin you've ever committed, past, present, and future. He died for every one of them. So your sins are forgotten. They're buried. By the way, Satan wants to bring those sins back up into your mind for remembrance. He does a good job at that. But remember, he's a liar. He's the father of lies. That's all he can do. Intimidate. Bring up our past. Thankful to say when Jesus said it is finished, he meant it is finished. One time, done. He died on our behalf. So God won't need to restrain us from it. Sin will have absolutely no appeal. It will be literally unthinkable. Will we ever be tempted? Will we be tempted to turn our backs on Christ like Satan? What would tempt us? Satan won't have any access to us. But you know what? Even if he did, we wouldn't be tempted. We'll know not only what righteousness is, but whatever. We'll also know what sin is and what sin did. We'll always know sin's cost. Every time we see the scarred hands of King Jesus, we'll remember what he had to go through for our sin. We'll see sin as God sees sin. Sin will be stripped of all its illusions, be utterly unappealing. So that's what the final resurrection is all about. When death will be swallowed up and the Bible says sin will be reversed never again to touch us. Church, this is what we should long for. This is what we should live for. Hey, if Jesus Christ did this for us, should we be living the best we can now to look forward to this place that we're going to go to? So I close by saying this, resurrection, it'll mean many things, but one of the most important things is this, including there will be no more sin. And aren't you thankful for that tonight? Let's stand together, heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here tonight, you have a need in your life. I mentioned it tonight that, that Satan wants to bring up our past sins, and I saw about 50 of you shake your head, yeah. Maybe he's battling you about what you've done in your past. Maybe it's a constant reminder. I want you to know something. Jesus died for that sin. And it's forgiven. And it's forgotten. And if someone's bringing up your past, and we know it's not from God, then who do you think's doing it? The old devil. So I pray that you'll put the devil under your feet where he belongs. Greater is he that's in you than he who's in the world. You are forgiven. It is forgotten You have been cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus. Don't let the devil beat you up over what you did years ago. You just remind him where he's going in the future. And we thank God for the shed blood of Jesus. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You have a need tonight. Would you just slip up your hand by that same? Pray for me. Bless all the hands tonight. Maybe you have an unsaved loved one. They need Jesus. You want to see them in this heaven that we're talking about. You want to remember them in prayer. Just slip your hand up by that same. Pray for me. Bless all the hands. God, we love you. Thank you again for this wonderful place called heaven. Thank you so much, Lord.
for dying on the cross on our behalf, for purchasing us. You bought us. Help us to live that way. You own us now. Help us to live accordingly. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Lord Jesus, we rebuke Satan through the blood of Jesus and all those who are struggling with their past. God, we, we pray they'll put it behind them, understanding, as Paul said, looking forward to those things which are ahead, not those things that are behind. God, I pray for all those who have needs tonight. I pray for all those tonight who have loved ones who are unsaved. God, we want to see all our loved ones, all our friends in heaven. And God, to the person we don't even know, help us to be a light to them. Help us to share with them this great news of eternal life in heaven. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, if you need to pray, the altars are open.